Hello and welcome back to The Note. Today we're going to talk about the madness of crowds, or should that be the wisdom of crowds? We all know that in markets sometimes it makes sense to surf along on top of a crowd and at other times there's a lot of money to be made by betting directly against it. How exactly can you tell when you should be betting against it or when it's telling you an important signal? With me now to discuss this is the Chief Investment Officer of Aberdeen Asset Management, Anne Richards. Good afternoon. And thank you very much for joining me. Let's start by taking a look at this chart of a, a particular anomaly at the moment, which is the way emerging markets, for no obvious reason, have fallen right out of favour. This is showing EM relative to developed markets, according to the MSI, MSCI indices, and they're now lower than they were uh, on the day that Lehman Brothers went down. What do you think is going on here? Well, it's interesting. This is a relative chart. So mm. actually, emerging markets have risen Yes. Um, off the low, but they have clearly not performed anything like as well as the more developed markets. And I think for a, a long period post Lehman, mm. um, people did still view as emerging markets as being somewhat insulated from the real problems that we'd got into in the developed market mm. banking sector. Um, I think that love affair began to unwind with the fear that the easy money that the Fed had been supplying as you go back into the middle of 2013, might start to, to pull back. And so yeah, you the flows, really absolutely, the flows really start to turn around at that point in time. Um, when we look at this, though, we, we say, actually, if you're a contrarian, um, if you look back 12 months, you've had this big relative underperformance, but you've seen earnings continue to progress in most of the companies that we're talking at. And although there's been some political challenges, we don't view them as being particularly more significant than you can see, for example, in the US, where you've seen the standoff at various yeah. points in time in Washington. So f to our view, actually, they look more attractive now than they did 12 months ago by some margin, and yet that's probably not a consensus view. Okay, but obviously the momentum is downwards. The crowd psychology at the moment is continuing to force EM downwards, but you're saying on a, on a longer term view you're comfortable betting against the crowd. I think that's absolutely right, because when we talk to companies at an individual level, they mm. still see the burgeoning middle class, they still see the rising demand in many of the markets that are in the emerging world. And that's really not changed very much over the last 12 to 18 months. So companies don't feel life really is too bad in those parts of the world. So you think you can follow the earnings in this case. Okay. Now, Let's take a look at an example where there aren't any earnings to follow. <laughs> a really glorious example of crowd psychology, which is Bitcoin. Now, let's start out by saying I see no argument at all that Bitcoin is not in a bubble. There are plenty of arguments about whether it will prove its worth in the long term. But what do you make of this extraordinary <laughs> behaviour of the Bitcoin price in well, the last few months? It's, it's marvellous, it's marvellous. And of course, Bitcoin was the big story, I think, of 2013, because it took everybody by surprise. It's not the digital mm. currencies are entirely new, but suddenly they came out into the public consciousness. And I think um, you know, a tulip by any other name would smell as sweet. Right. So you know, I'm kind of with you on that one. But I think what is interesting is what it tells you about the psychology of faith in the financial system, the psychology of society at large. And I think the success of Bitcoin has been driven by, first of all, the speed of transactions, the low cost of transaction, and most importantly of all, the privacy of transactions. And although that might have some appeal to perhaps the less legal parts um, of the commercial world, um, actually, for many people, privacy is a big issue now. So I think this tells you quite a lot about the desire for privacy and the fear that any transaction that you do in a conventional financial system online, anybody can get access to your data if they're clever enough. So I think that's one of the things that, that comes out from this. So this is about distrust not only in fiat currencies, which is where a lot of the arguments come, come from, but also distrust in governments and distrust in conventional banks. Yes, and distrust in surveillance. So there's a transactional element you know, in terms of a traditional currency. This is an alternative currency. There's also some people who view it as an alternative store of value, as an asset, to your point mm. about fiat currencies. It's also interesting when you think about regulation more generally. This is mm. outside the regulated financial system. And we're seeing that in other areas, crowdsourcing, fund-to-fund, peer-to-peer uh, lending, lending and so forth. So regulation hasn't been quick to keep up with the pace of some of the innovation that's going on there. And by squeezing perhaps too hard on some elements of the financial mm. system, what you're then seeing is activity start to move outside the conventional system. And I think that's what we're seeing here with Bitcoin. Okay, and thank you very much indeed. To conclude, yes, obviously Bitcoin price is in a bubble at the moment, but it is still telling us something very serious, which is that there is deep distrust with conventional finance as it currently operates. If you want some way to go along with this, uh, what the crowd here is telling you without necessarily 
uh, betting on Bitcoin, start looking at any kind of play which attempts to disintermediate what has traditionally been done by banks.